And we're back. Welcome yep. to episode 13 of We Absolutely oh. Should Start a Podcast. I called this file episode 12. Look at me, not knowing how no, to count. Oh, no. <laughs> Did the little song last time. That's all right. It's just the local name. I will upload it properly. How are you, mate? Good. Back from the holidays. Drove back from oh, Scotland uh, last night. So, ready to be here. We're recording this a couple of days late, but that means we get to record two this week. So, that makes it a good week, right? It does. It does. We're even considering a couple of new segments, which will be fun. Exactly. Um, exactly. Mainly because I'm just too lazy to do my own research. But what else went out? Yeah. So, we released episode 12 this week. The first book summary went out. Um, yep. Elliot and I watched the book summary and we cringed ourselves a little bit, but I still hey, think it's a good book summary. Practice makes perfect, man. It's hopefully one of many. Uh, and now you, you're back in town. I expect a few shorts to be coming out this week. Yeah, we're going to throw out a few shorties. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Well, um, are you drinking anything? I know it's a Monday, but. No, I'm not. And oh. not just because it's a Monday, because I looked in my fridge and I don't have anything. Really? Yeah. Like, I've, <laughs> I've got some water in my water bottle, but uh, given that it's a Monday, I didn't really prep the, the fridge full of beer. But uh, this what do you got? episode sponsored by water. Mm. I have the Step Above Water, which is... a I show my same cup every week. It's not like it's a new cup. <laughs> I have... The uh, French press M and S roast number six this morning, but oh, I put a little bit expenses. of put a little bit of chai masala uh, flavoring in it. Give it a little bit of cinnamony, cardamony taste. It's quite nice. It's quite spicy in a good way. This man is too fancy for me. That's that's for sure. Yeah, good. Well, well, let's jump into it. What are you talking about man. this week, mate? So I thought, yeah, I've been, I've been pondering bringing this up on the podcast for a few weeks now, but this whole release of GitHub's Copilot. Um, so for those that don't know, it's a assistive coding tool based loosely on technologies like GPT-3. Um, OpenAI has a similar language model called Codex, which is about more technical applications and code generation. GitHub trained that on a huge corpus of open source programs and now they've released it as a ten dollar a month service for anybody that wants to use it it was in beta for a while um, and there's been a lot of pushback from the development community about should people be using this does it make sense in a corporate setting and also you know did they have any right to just pull all of this code and in some cases regurgitate some of this code uh, despite claims to the contrary uh, so I thought we'd dig into that because uh, it's yep. an interesting one and it touches on the world of AI. Um, so give me, yeah. I've, I've, my understanding of Copilot is the four second Google that I did before this episode when you told me you're going to be talking about Copilot. So not only do you pretend that no one knows what they're talking, the audience doesn't know what they're talking about, just know that I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> let's dumb it right down for me. Yeah, good. So the tool is... Uh, a lot of uh, development environments for a long time would have sort of code completion tools. So you type the start of the name of a variable and it'll say, oh, I know about that variable. Just press tab and we'll fill out the rest. Or like this function exists and you've typed the first six letters, just autocomplete like on your smartphone. This takes that to the next level. So the way it works in an example they give is you write a comment in your code, which is, a function to download the name of all US cities from Wikipedia and rather than suggest the next line, it suggests the whole function. Yeah. And you know, it's it's not perfect, but it's ninety but it does a lot of the grunt work really, really well. Um, and it was trained on uh, like billions of lines of code, they claim. Uh, a lot of it coming naturally from GitHub, uh, and a lot of it being well, all of it being open source. Um, so that's, you know, libraries and tools that other people have developed that they've released in the public under various different licenses, uh, which is where some of the complexity comes in. Uh, but, you know, the, critiquing the tool itself, it seems to do a pretty good job. Like, it seems to be useful. It would likely help uh, developers be a bit more productive. But 
where the criticism comes in and, and what I thought would be interesting to talk about today is around the legalities, mm -hmm. the ethics, the risk of using this tool and also what precedents it might end up setting uh, because of that. Absolutely. Yeah, the first one comes to mind is healthcare, right? And the precedent it sets for healthcare. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so yeah. just a question on this. Is this tool targeted at someone like you or someone like me? So someone who knows what they're doing versus someone who knows how to open a terminal and run a function. I think uh, developers. So yeah, more along the lines of people actively writing code every day who just don't want to write, they call it boilerplate code. So it's kind of all the stuff that isn't really uniquely yours, but you just kind of got to do it anyway. You know, make the request to Wikipedia, download the table, pull out the relevant columns, that sort of thing. Um, it's so really just to just... automate a lot of that. I can't just open a, a new uh, a new script and type comment, write me AI to detect prostate cancer just yet. No, no. Like, but if you wanted to do simple stuff, like let's say, you know, something you and I have done in the past is grab housing prices off a website. Yeah. Um, I've actually wanted you, to redo that. Yeah. Like something like that, it would probably help you out a lot. It's sort of that read the docs loop and do it yourself and it's like all that boilerplate it, it does a pretty good job you'd probably have to tweak it it wouldn't work exactly you know it doesn't know about realestate.com.au but it probably can do a pretty good pass at not that we've been most of the way there. not that we've been scraping data from realestate.com.au in our life at all <laughs> no 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 this was well beyond the statute of limitations if we ever did so uh don't sue um i do some, some of the uproar... an episode of us getting sued that'd be fun <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and live, live from the courthouse episode, you know, 4,000. Um, yeah, so the, a big part of the uproar from the open source community is you're not really using this code as it was intended to be used. You know, we put this stuff out in licenses and it's generating code that sort of does pretty much what our library did that you trained it on without asking anyone and What's that going to do? How does the code that it produces fall under these various licenses? Is it under its own license, new license? Uh, and what does that mean? And the position from GitHub and OpenAI, so OpenAI Developed Codex, uh, has been the output code, that's your problem, you deal with that, but it is completely within the rules of fair use to scrape all of your code and use it to train an AI model. And that is no violation of copyright laws or anything else because it's far enough away from replicating the work that it should fall outside um, the sort of copyright protections and more into fair use territory. And OpenAI has actually put in a, uh, a document into the USPTO, the, the Patent, Patent and Trademark Office in the US, explaining why they think it's important to set a precedent that this is fair use uh, and that you could grab data from anywhere that you can get it, assuming you can acquire it by legal means, which they did. You know, they didn't. Yeah, it was in know, the user terms. Steal the right. code. Um, they just used it for something that I suppose the original developers probably never intended, and now they're trying to insist, okay, that's fair use, um, which is yeah, sparked a lot of pushback and back and forth in a number of different directions. Mm. So. Bit of history on GitHub. They are, I want to say they're a darling of the industry, right? Like I've never really heard a bad word against GitHub. Um, I'm sure there's a lot flying around and stuff like that, but they were recently bought by Microsoft, right? Like 2020. Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. So it's a Microsoft product now. Mm. Uh, I, I think you're right. They are a darling of the industry. You know, there are competitors, GitLab uh, and some others. Source Hut, I think, is a more recent one. But they're by and large the big player in the source mm. code hosting space. And do you think this is part of a monetization strategy by Microsoft to bring a bit more out of the users? Or is this been coming for a while? I think it's been coming for a while. Um, and I should say GitHub are not the only people that are putting out tools like this. Uh, I think Amazon's about to release an assistive coding tool and one of the other big tech players is as well. I can't remember who it was. But they're not going to be the only person that does this. Mm -hmm. um, so they just happen to be the most prominent and the first out the gate. Yeah. 
uh, which, yeah, is raising all these flags. And so the way they've done it is the issue, right? It's not, it's the way that the, they've taken people's data, packaged it up, and are now charging back the outputs of that to people. That was something originally free. Yeah, it's a little bit of a question of, is this model encapsulating our open source work in a way that violates the original license? So like a lot of open source licenses, you can use it freely, but you may need to distribute the same source code or your project may not be allowed to be used for commercial purposes or what have yep. you. Uh, and the question here is, okay, if I take code that's the output of uh, Copilot, is it fresh code? Is it under the license of the original training material? And if so, which training material? And a big part of this was you know, GitHub and uh, OpenAI say, look, it doesn't regurgitate code. But if you go on Twitter at the moment, you can see plenty of examples where somebody will put a comment in and it will line, say, so I'll, I'll give you a famous example. So there's this function in the Quake 2 uh, I don't know if you ever played that, like first-person shooter. Mm. It's like a fast inverse square root function. So it's to calculate like one on R squared, square rooted or whatever, which is used in a lot of like distance calculations between two objects in games. And the code is like a complete mindfuck. It's like does all these weird bitwise operations to really do it very quickly. And, you know, comments in that source code are like, how the fuck does this work and all this sort of stuff. And somebody writes in an example that I've seen a comment of, you know, fuss inverse square root. It regurgitates the code almost exactly. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I didn't check it line by line, but it's got the dumb comments in it as well. And then it says, generate a license for this code as another comment. And it generates a completely different license that is conflicting with the original Quake 2 source code license. Um, to give you an example of the minefield that's coming in here. Mm. Um, and I think the hardest part about this is, you know, a lot of developers these days, if you're working on a new open source project, maybe this isn't or a hobby project, maybe this isn't a big deal, but if you're an enterprise and you accidentally bring source code into your company's code base, that is now protected by some license that your company hasn't ticked off on or is a potential you know, conflict or, or copyright infringement, I think most large corporates out there that know what they're doing will have a zero risk policy against that. So is this, what ramifications are we starting to see already and what are we likely to see for? So yeah. nobody's, nobody's gone to court yet. So legally it's hard to say. There's a lot of people that have, uh, or a lot of corporates that have sort of put out a, we can't use this internally sort of policy because of those reasons. It's just too high risk. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, back to your earlier point of healthcare, uh, you know, it's a very similar environment where there's stuff that might work really well 95% of the time, but that 5% is so mission critical that it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you're willing to throw away the benefits because that 5% is just totally unacceptable. And it sounds like um, this unknown risk is going to cause a the reverse adoption of this tool, like uh, the disadoption, the decline of use of this tool, because companies will come out and just ban it outright. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it's probably had a negative effect overall. The question on my mind is, can GitHub's size and momentum overpower that uh, there are a lot of open source developers now which are talking about hey you should pull your code off github and put it on another platform and yeah. things like this which is a nice way to protest but ultimately like the team at github is not going to give a shit where your code is they will happily scrape it wherever if their belief is that that's fair use it's not really going to put any protections in place and also there are some people is, considering github is large mm -hmm. enough now as well from an enterprise point of view that open source isn't as powerful as it once was when it was getting started yeah it's hard to say i mean prior to github a lot of code was on a website called sourceforge uh, that was really popular uh, and 
SourceForge started packaging sort of like malware and crap in their code and it put a lot of people off and there was a mass exodus of SourceForge onto GitHub uh, about 10 years ago. And there's people saying, okay, maybe this is the tipping point. Mm. You know, there's going to be a mass exodus of GitHub. SourceForge 2.0. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see where that comes out. Um, people are also talking about generating modified versions of existing licenses, which is you're allowed to use this code, but not for the training of AI models. Um, which is, you know, we'll see. I guess if they did that, then, you know, nominally uh, GitHub would have to respect that. There is a question of how would you know um, if it's in the training corpus of uh, these models. And one of the interesting things I saw in the RFC that they submitted to the patent office was part of ensuring that we do not infringe copyright is never releasing the training data because releasing the training data may be a replication of source material, which would infringe copyright. So they've given themselves this weird legal loophole, which is like, oh no, we're not releasing the training data because that would be bad, but also trust us, your stuff is definitely not in the training data, which to me is a bit sus. Mm. Um, yeah. So we've talked about one ramification, which is like a potential decline in usage of this tool. Um, Mm -hmm. organizations take a zero risk policy as you said and just stop using it or ban it outright another ramification for this is the world where we suddenly end up in legal battles between organizations where you know the ultimate example would be the two uh, tech behemoths suing each other because someone used someone's uh, function within it yeah, so the, yeah, the, there's a few things that sprung to mind when I looked into how this was all coming together. One of them was uh, the Android Oracle, or I guess Google Oracle lawsuit that went on for many, many years about the Android platform using Java and a number of different sort of Java interfaces, but rewriting uh, the underlying code from scratch. And Oracle said, you're using our, our code mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to sue you for it. And that went on for, you know, the best part of a decade, trying to work out whether Google re-implementing a number of functions that happen to have the same name and take the same arguments was enough of a deviation from the original code base to be mm -hmm. acceptable. Uh, and I think in the end, like for most, I don't know the exact outcome, but like Google won that lawsuit uh, and they were able to do that. So, you know, they're is likely to be other pictures here, which is like, well, if a developer reads a bunch of code on the internet and then writes something that's similar in principle, but they wrote it themselves, you know, that's technically speaking fair use and, and all of these other things. When that ultimately lands in the letter of the law, I don't know. And I, I'm conflicted. I am internally conflicted about this because on the one hand, uh, people should be able to get training data from publicly available things and train their models. Uh, because if you can't do that, then you would massively slow down the progress of AI. Think about how many language models or image models are trained from publicly available data. Um, but on the other hand, like I do see where there's some pushback from the open source community around this um, and how this is being a difficult issue. The other one, the other idea that sort of came to mind is around emulators, like video game mm. emulators. Uh, and, you know, there was a big back and forth about the legality of emulators. Um, so Sony sued a couple of companies about who made PlayStation emulators. They ultimately lost that battle. So building emulators is legal, um, but directly ripping, say, like games off CDs is, is clearly not. Uh, but, you know, within that world, the companies like, say, Nintendo have done a lot of things to get around that provision. So I don't know if you remember, like, the old school Game Boys, when you turned them on, the Game Boy logo came down. Mm. So the way that works is that all of the cartridges need a certain uh, set of instructions at the start to make that correctly display the Game Boy logo. And if you don't have that, it doesn't run. And... That meant that if you did that without license, you were directly infringing mm. on 
Nintendo's copyright. Uh, but if you wanted to get around it, your game wouldn't run. Uh, so yeah, you could technically pirate a game, but unless you had that little code block that would display the trademarked Game Boy logo, your game wouldn't run. And that, that's how they protected their sort of ability to sort of license games uh, without it being, you know, you can't copy the underlying source code. And I think, you know, we may end up seeing similar things uh, in this scenario. I don't know how it's going to end up, but that was another one that came to yeah, mind. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So let's, let's switch to uh, other ramifications, what this means for other industries. Also, let's play a little bit of like future future casting right and see what scenarios could come out of this so where where did your mind go when you we've already mentioned healthcare so i'm sure we'll end up there but where else did your mind go when you read this of ramifications on other industries in terms of precedent precedence yeah i mean i think the the image generation stuff which has been out recently and and we've talked about quite extensively that's another one that you know, people who maybe don't develop code might understand mm -hmm. If you train it on publicly available information, say pictures online, and then you tell uh, it to say, generate a picture of the Mona Lisa, is there any sort of you know, violation of copyrights or anything else? Or, you know, maybe Mona Lisa is not a great one because that's yeah. probably in the public domain at this point. Pick a, pick a famous um, photographer, let's right? Say, Someone. Yeah, a famous photographer or like you know, a cartoon image uh or anything else um you can you can kind of see where those lines get blurred mm. um and then you know i guess to the question of fair use if i want to start scraping youtube videos to train my video model or if i wanted to start scraping images from various sites to train my image model you know is that okay assuming that information is mm. is publicly available um and they're arguing yes so um, what about ramifications for the open source community? I'll say it sounds like they're working to, work, to protect themselves some more. Is this going to result in more open source or less open source? Long question and nuanced question, but. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I think this is one of those things that'll likely blow over after a little while and maybe not have any long-term ramifications except some adjusted licenses. Um, I think, you know, most open source has been chronically underfunded, chronically under-supported for a long time. So I think people sort of see this as a bit of a kick. Um, and one comment that I saw, which I think was quite a funny summary here is that, okay, Microsoft, if this is all fair use and this isn't a problem, why haven't you trained Copilot on all of the Windows and Office product source code as well? Why just use our code if this isn't a problem? Mm. Uh, which I thought was kind of funny in that, you know, if Microsoft isn't willing to put the Windows source code into the training corpus, uh, you know, are they really saying that these, the output of these tools and things isn't likely to regurgitate things that would be suspicious? Um, and, you know, somebody said, why don't we train our own version of Copilot on just leaked copies of the various <laughs> Microsoft source codes uh, and then wait for the lawsuit? Uh, because I'm sure there would be yeah. one. Let's, uh, let's, let's start talking about um, precedents around health and other, other areas as well. So obviously the question of who owns the data is something we brought up in healthcare is something we brought up last week in episode 12. What? Mm. What does a scenario like this look like in health? So I think where health is different and a little bit more nuanced is that uh, for most purposes, there's not as much publicly available health data as there is open source mm -hmm. code. You know, there are repositories like the Cancer Imaging Archive and, and others that have data available, uh, but they're typically not as vast as, as the open source community. Certainly my data, my health data and your health data uh, are not out there in the public uh, in that way. So, you know, if I hacked into some Cerner database and pulled all the data and 
use that to train my AI model, I couldn't claim fair use because I'd violated some laws in accessing that data in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does, it does raise similar questions. You know, even these repositories like Cancer Imaging Archive, they have pretty strict licenses around some of their data sets uh, and what they can and can't be used for. Um, but if this sets a precedent that, you know, use for training AI models is potentially fair use of, of data. Um, and, you know, in generative health models, let's say, for example, um, that could pose an interesting question. I think within the healthcare world, because we're so heavily regulated from a sort of medical devices point of view, I don't think a product like this would necessarily even cut the mustard in terms of getting regulatory approval. Um, because if it was claiming to say generate I don't know, trans or let's say generate reports for patients based on a couple of line summary. Uh, I just think it would be so hard to show consistent output. You know, if I say Tom needs a report about his fingers uh, because, you know, the x-ray showed this, that or the other, and it generated a full report that nobody checked, I just think it'd be almost impossible to get that approved yep. uh, in a meaningful way. Yeah. I suppose it, but if we take it up a level, which is like, you provide your data, we use that data to train, we then monetize that data, uh, we, we then monetize that, and there's potential where you end up getting charged to <laughs> have the outputs of that, right? Like, this is the million, trillion dollar question in healthcare and AI over the next 10 years is what right do we have to use the data and what right do we have to produce insights from it? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think where healthcare is less likely to run into the same problem is that, you know, there's these open source licenses aren't typically applied to healthcare data. I mean, some stuff is under Creative Commons, mm -hmm. but if you were negotiating a deal with, say, you know, a big provider network, there would be pretty strict usage statements about what that data can and can't be used for, and you'd have to adhere to that, otherwise you'd likely get into a lot of legal trouble. Yeah. yeah. Well, where do you, where do you see this going over the next 12 to two years, 12 months to 24 months? Um, I think ultimately it will be deemed fair use. I think we'll see some angry people in the community about that statement, but I think ultimately the fact that publicly available data uh, and readily available data can be used to train AI and move the corpus of research forward is a good thing. I would hate to think that you would need signed permission from every developer to use their code in your uh, you know, AI model because nothing would ever happen again. Do you think there'll be a bifurcation of open source where it's open open source and then partially open source and then obviously not uh, then closed. Yeah, I mean, we started to see this a little bit uh, already in that, you know, some companies, uh, let's say the browser space, for example, um, there's browsers that are sort of partial open source, so they'll keep their secret. So it's quite a competitive market, as you can imagine. Um, they'll keep some of that stuff internal uh, and then open source other parts of it, which they're happy to share. I think we will see quite a bit of that. Uh, and you might see what you see a little bit in the, funnily enough, machine learning open source space is you'll open source sort of N minus one. So you'll open source the model that was kind of good, but not the very best version. And yeah, sure you can have that, but my competitive advantage is I have a closed source version that's always one step ahead of this one. Yeah, that seems like a happy balance for to promote innovation and promote yeah. collaboration. Promote cl collaboration. Yeah, I agree. I think that is the, the sort of best middle ground that we can mm. we can get to. Um, I mean, you know, the other thing is maybe GitHub can just find a way to reimburse all of these people, even a tiny amount, uh, because you know. A lot of these people are, as I said, chronically underfunded and 
you know, large parts of there's a I think it's an XKCD comic somewhere, which is like you know enterprise software stacks, and it's like all of these tools, and then there's this one tiny little fulcrum down the bottom, which is uh, you know the library maintained by some dude named Dave who's been maintaining this library for like 25 years as open source. Uh, and I think that's a very real picture of the yeah. world. Well, yeah, that'd be interesting. Is like suddenly like switch the incentives of if you're, if you're, uh, if your uh, information becomes useful in training of this, then you'll, there's a revenue share model. Yeah. Hard yeah. to do, I imagine. I think, yeah, especially if it does get ruled that it's fair use. Like, I don't know how you'd do it that way, but, yeah. you know, from GitHub's perspective to win back the developer community, them putting some percentage of their revenue from Copilot into a, you know, open source support mm. fund, I think would probably be a good marketing yeah. move. So if you're listening to GitHub, you heard it here first. <laughs> Which they certainly are. All right, Matt, shall we, shall we switch gear? I'm going to mark the clip. Mark the clip. Go. Added Ooh. marker. So. I don't know what that does, but let's, let's mark the clip. Yeah, tell me. What, what have you been um, reading? So this is actually a follow-on from last week from something that I mentioned, um, and we talked about a little bit. And um, it's a report on how to save a quarter of a trillion dollars in U.S. healthcare through administrative simplification. So last week we talked about how the U.S. healthcare spends a lot of money. It's a huge industry, 17% of GDP. It's about $3.8 trillion is spent on healthcare in the U.S. every year. Um, that's removing the kind of COVID uh, bump as well, we'll say. Um, but about 25% of that, so nearly a trillion dollars, is spent on administration. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about that and I found the report where it came from. And funnily enough, it was a 76 page McKinsey report. Um, for those for those playing at home, I used to work there. So uh, I have nothing to do with the production of this report or any insightful secrets behind it or anything like that. I'm just reading the one that's available, uh, available online. But yeah, I wanted to dig into it because trillion dollars on administration sounds like a lot of money. It does sound like a lot of money. So the, I'll, what I'm going to run through is just a little bit of a synopsis, a little bit of the methodology, then we'll dive into the results, and then we'll dive into, and then we'll p speak about the limitations, the criticisms, you know, because there's always limitations in reports like this. And then we'll spend some time on the so what. So the report kicks off with this idea that technology, innovation, and scale generally drives a reduction in administration expenses over time. And this has happened in nearly every industry from hailing a taxi through to the financial services. Administration as a percentage of revenue tends to go down over time, except in healthcare. Um, since 19, and I'll just say that when I say healthcare in this situation, I'm generally referring to just US healthcare. Um, it might be different in other, in, in other, in other countries. So since 1995, administration costs have been rising as a percentage of total, total healthcare budgets. Uh, and it's now kind of up at the 25% or what uh, level. And not only that, um, you, we've been seeing a significant amount of, uh, it, it, so that not only has it been changing as a percentage of uh, total healthcare budgets, healthcare contributed 9% of GDP over the last, uh, the 9% of GDP growth over the last 10 years to the US, but it accounted for like 28% of the workforce growth, which means uh, the number of people working in healthcare is growing much, much faster than the amount of GDP it's contributing to the system, which means more inputs for, uh, to get the same amount of output, they needed much more input in terms of workers. Um, and like, let's be honest, administration costs aren't inherently bad, but um, so is this a bad number? Is 25% a bad number? Should it be 30%? Should it be 20%? Um, the only real comparison that you can find is an OECD report from 2011, which showed that the US was by far the mm -hmm. most expensive uh, country out of the ones in the OECD um, uh, for administration spend. So um, this is 2011 and they probably didn't have the same methodology, so the numbers don't add up, but if we just use it as relative. But 
the US spent 7.5% of their total budgets on administration, whereas Germany, Germany was 5.5% and Canada was down at 3.5%. So the US spends a lot more on administration than other countries. So that's kind of like the first finding of the report is that a lot of money is spent on administration. But the like big part of this report is, and the second, uh, the big part of it is that they reckon there's about $265 billion worth of savings available to the system um, with varying degrees of easiness to implement. But $265 billion, by the way, is uh, the equivalent to size of Medicare Part A, which in the US, which is everything, all of the funding for inpatient services, inpatient um, testing and laboratory services and surgeries. So basically this saving could pay for every single surgery in the US each year, which is whopping. That's crazy. And I mean, and then 20% more because if we're making this more admin efficient, we're, uh, we're losing money there too. That's uh, yeah. That's so money. how to save a quarter of a trillion dollars is the title of this article. So they went about it in two ways. First off, they wanted to figure out how much is actually spent on administration in the US because it's not some budget line item. There's private, there's public, there's lots of different players involved, everyone from the single local GP all the way through to the uh, Medi Medicaid itself in the US. So it's quite an, quite an exhaustive report in figuring out if we consider healthcare as a whole, what is the administration spends? So the, uh, the that's the first part. And then the second part is, okay, once we figured out what all this administration expense is, how much is there potentially to save and how does it compare to other industries? Mm. So um, the first part, estimating, estimating how much is actually spent on administration. Um, they looked at healthcare over the last two decades and it's kind of rent, uh, healthcare spend and they kind of figured out that administration varied between 15 and 35% uh, of spend over the last two decades. Um, they kind of came to the 25% the number adjusted for wealth, et cetera. And the way they did that is they split it into five different groups. They had private payers, public payers, providers, physician groups, and then other services. Now, what they did for the private payers, those are generally listed companies They went into their, all their SEC filings and everything like that, all their annual reports, and basically like pulled out everything being like administration, administration, administration. There's lots of like services that will also estimate this stuff for you that I'm sure they used. And so they came out with an administration number for them. Then they did the same for physician groups and physician groups are the doctors that aren't involved with hospitals basically. So, you know, your local GP practice or uh, the private rooms of a, of a certain doctor. Um, what they did there, a lot of interviews, a lot of like where they could get available information um, and came to the administration costs for them. And then they did the same for hospitals. And then for the public payers, they basically went to state by state, figured out the budgets, uh, and they figured out the reimbursements for the fee for service, and then took that away from the total budget to end up at the administration. So pretty thorough. Um, it's not an exact number in these things, but like, if you consider it directional, it's like, okay, wow. And they came up with this number of about 950 billion, so almost a trillion dollars on administration. The one thing that stuck out, stood out to me is as a percentage of revenue, physician groups had the highest administration burden. Um, and if you think about it, that makes sense because they're generally, there's 11,000 physician groups in the US compared to 600 hospitals. So they're a lot smaller and therefore they wouldn't get the scale of a hospital. So once they figured out that there's about a trillion dollars spent on administration, they then went in and uh, looked at where it was all spent and then dug into where they think they could reduce some of that. And they split it and they split it into five different areas. And those were like kind of, and one of the biggest that they split into five different areas, there's like traditional back office. So that's like your HR, your accounting, like, you know, in every single company, then they've got the back office that's specific to healthcare. So that would be like nurse scheduling and things like that. They then had the financial transactions ecosystem, which like huge, it, it, it's a huge part of it. And that's just all about receiving money for the services provided. Um, and then they had like some customer patient service stuff like booking phone, uh, booking appointments and things like that. Um, and then they had administrative clinical support. So that was a lot of like case management and things like that. So they split into those five areas and then like 
jumped into each of them to look where the savings could be done. And they looked in across kind of three areas. It's like, right, what could individual groups do by themselves with a simple policy change themselves? What could groups do if they had to collaborate together and improve how they work together? And then the third one was like huge, huge sweeping changes across the industry, which would require like governmental in, in and a governmental involvement. And so it was kind of like a little bit of a, well, if we just looked at the within the organization, that's the easiest and the hardest is the seismic changes as they called it, which is we need government regulation to change, which is a good way to do it. But so you can like get a degree of ease of implementation. But what blew my mind is usually like the easiest to do is also the smallest. But out of the 265 billion, like 75% was within just organizations changing internal policies. I mean, that, that strikes me as, I don't know, like the people that run hospitals aren't idiots. Is there something blocking this that maybe wasn't addressed here? Like if it really is as simple as changing internal policies, why has it Yeah, so, and this is one of the limitations and criticisms from me or the report is that it doesn't really dive into why the US is sitting at 25% uh, administration costs it it doesn't dive into the complexity mm. that underlies all of this and so i think that it was has resulted in them simplifying things a little bit too much but but yeah. we'll, we'll jump into that but it's a good question of like yeah and it, it's one of these things as well where it's like these reports are always written in a like aspirational directional hey healthcare you could probably save a bit of money we don't know whether it's 265 or 26.5 billion, but like you could probably save some money. Um, and please, please consult with us. Exactly. To, uh, exactly. How. <laughs> so let's jump into the results off the back of that. And so they found that they found that there's 950 billion spent in healthcare. They found they found that 265 billion could be saved across the five areas that we talked about, like the back office and stuff like that. 175 billion out of that 265 could just be changing internal practices and policies. Uh, another 105 billion would become from broad structural changes. Uh, these are things such as like making medical, standardizing medical licenses across the entire United States. Um, and then there was just a pitiful 35 billion between organizations working better together. So we're not even gonna bother talking about that. Um, if we jumped into like the two biggest areas of savings, um, if we consider the five areas that they of costs that they considered, um, the biggest one was industry agnostic back office. What that means is HR, finance, uh, IT, things that will be in everything from Google through to GE, and basically. <sighs> This is the limitation is there was like this. Uh, the reason why it's big is that there's a lot of money spent in this area. And so if you could reduce it, there's about 400 billion of the almost half the um, total administration spend is in this industry agnostic bucket. And they don't really jump into how they're going to make it better. But what I suspect is that um, they kind of talk about how it's been slow to adopt automation, digitization in certain areas. So there's still a lot of people required to do a lot of different, what would normally be automated in other industries. So an example was like expense reports or scheduling of nurse time and stuff like that. It's not digital, it's not automated. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't anything hugely concrete, but basically what I suspect that they've done is they've gone right per X thousand employees or per dollar of revenue, we know in finance that HR is this big. We know in energy, uh, HR is this big. We know in um, we know in uh, manufacturing, HR is this big. And if we compare it to the hospital and the healthcare system, they employ way too many HR people per uh, compared to these benchmarked industries. So they should reduce. That, that's what I suspect that they've done. Their kind of answer is uh, how to reach this is like a lot of words around operational excellence and stuff like that. But there wasn't any really 
concrete answer as to how they're gonna they're gonna get to this point. But as I said, I suspect that compared benchmarking to other industries, healthcare is much larger in these in these functions. Yeah, but I think it's one of those things that, you know, you build software for some other industry, it sells for X thousand dollars. You get HIPAA compliance and you sell it into the healthcare industry, you sell it for 10 X thousand dollars because, well, yeah. somebody's got to pay for the risk and you're willing to pay for it. So let's charge you 10 times as much. I just think that's such a systemic thing that's, like it's all well and good to say, let's do industry agnostic yeah. HR, but is the same HR provider that's going to schedule, you know, who's working at Domino's going to accept the risk of if you fuck yeah. up and there's not enough nurses and somebody yeah. dies, it's on you. I, I just yeah, don't think I, like, they are for the same cost. The compliance, the compliance function of HR in a hospital is a lot different to the uh, compliance function in an accounting company. Yeah, yeah, which, like, it makes me question a lot of this industry agnostic stuff. Like, even with IT, you know, when, when we've done work in the hospitals in the yeah. past, like, it's just, there's layers upon layers upon layers. And ultimately, you're not paying because it's more complex in that environment. You're paying because there's somebody needs to absorb the risk. And ultimately, you've got to pay people to absorb yeah. risk. So, this is, this is like, this, this point here was my biggest criticism here, which is like, it's the biggest bucket of saving and there's pretty limited detail on it. Um, but the biggest thing that kept coming out of this on me is like, it's, the, it's these physician groups where a lot of this administration spend is. And we, and you see that in practice. And I think that's a very difficult one to solve because a lot of them, what we've seen in Australia, and I assume it's semi applicable from Australia is that they're small groups, they're all doctors and they run their own business. And they're not sitting there going, oh, I'm going to compare myself to the financial industry and check that my HR team is on point. They're like, no, I'm just going to spend an extra, what is, uh, spend a little bit extra every year and I'm just going to have a practice manager. And it's going to be inefficient, but in some way, and I'm sure I could get some software involved, but like, hey, I don't know how to use a computer because I'm a 50 year old surgeon. Um, so I'm just going to like pay someone to do it and it's going to be fine and I can afford it. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that's true. And I mean, that's probably why, you know, here and in the U S we see all these roll-ups yeah. like 21st century oncology that got bought by Genesis and, and similarly even, you know, icon and Genesis here in Australia. Like if you want to optimize that, maybe the answer is just yeah. buy them all up and centralize yep. and, uh, the P firms. And then that causes other them. issues. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, we'll so the next area that. of biggest saving was the financial transaction ecosystem, which, and the report does a much better job of this, and I, I, mm. l I'd like to spend some time on this, but the financial transaction ecosystem is all about, I'm a doctor and I need to get paid, and I'm, a, and I'm an insurer, and I need to cover this individual. We need to transact. And it blew my mind as to how much money is spent on this. And like this area seems nuts to me. There is like $250 billion spent on just this of I'm a doctor, I need to get paid and I'm an insurer and I need to pay you to service my customer, uh, to service my, uh, my member. And there's $250 billion spent on this every year. Just that. Like in every other industry, you swipe your credit card and, it's crazy. <laughs> and walk away. At, and there's two areas. Yeah. Like it, 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 this area just seems nuts to me. Physicians reckon they lose 17 to 25% of their Medicaid revenue just due to billing problems. Like they send the bill and they never get it back, which means they put up prices on the people that they yeah, actually I, do end up trading. Yeah. And I know for a fact, uh, you know, obviously I can't go into the details, but I know for a fact that that happens here, even in the public healthcare system, because systems don't have billing codes for certain procedures or tests and they can't just not do them in a public setting so yeah. they just take the cost on the chin 
Uh, and that's probably yeah, or they start like sneaking things in as well, being like in some. Oh yeah, hospitals. we definitely did that procedure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or they do it, you know, like you'll get a blood test, and yeah, well, I think this is probably more common in the private setting, but it's oh, you know what? Maybe the doctor wants this additional test done, and we know we have a billing code for that one, uh, and you meet the criteria for getting billed for that one, so you're not paying. Yeah. So we'll slap that one on top. Uh, and we, I mean, Absolutely. we've seen that happen too. So there's two areas in this that they dug into. Yeah. One is claims processing. So just dealing with how a, how a provider will bill a uh, payer. And then there's prior authorization, which seems to be this like really cooked thing of like, this is an expensive procedure. And we need to, before we agree for you to do this procedure on the patient, we need to give you prior authorization to do it which seems cooked, but anyway. So claims processing, processing, yeah. another, a lovely $165 billion is spent each year just, and quote from the report, just to collect the fee for service. Um, now they're kind of like the, why this has got to this stage, they reckon is that there's a huge amount of complexity because, and this is like one of the reasons why the US healthcare system does have a high administration burden is because there is many providers and there's many payers and both are incentivized to both are incentivized to play the game. As a provider, you're incentivized not to uh, to over, to charge as much as possible from the payers and as a payer, you're incentivized to pay as little as possible to the providers. So, there's just this battle. And what that results in is pay it, mm. providers trying to bill for more stuff and payers trying to increase the complexity to reduce what people can claim for. And it, because there's like, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to get the number wrong, but there was hundreds of uh, payers, so insurers in the US. This means that basically every single one of them has a slightly different process, slightly different questions. And it's a medical, it's a medical back, it's a medical procedure and generally what ends up happening is physicians have to spend a lot of time filling out claims and their time is expensive about 2.6 hours a week mm. is spent on claims processing which is like five percent of a 40 hour week which is a lot from a like a highly trained specialist point of view yeah that's crazy uh I, I saw something this week uh or in the last week actually about this in that there's a new regulation in the US that there's a certain group of standard procedures or standard billings that now all of the insurance providers in the US have to publicly list their uh, mm. how much they're going to reimburse for those procedures. Um, so I think it's in an effort to try and standardize this and make it more transparent uh, and put some competitiveness back so into the system. So this just... Uh this, the, the first point is that like compl uh, complexity of forms and submissions has outpaced the automation in the area. Uh, and so doctors are spending a lot of time just filling out these forms because they're getting more and more complex and the more and more things that have to be split up uh, uh, to bill individual item items are occurring. The next reason for this is that um, Incomplete and inaccurate submissions seem to be a huge, huge time sink for both for both parties. Things are rejected off the bat, which generally results triggers a manual intervention by the payer, and then they will give feedback to the doctors, and the doctors will then either have to redo it or they lose the money. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. I, I, but again, not surprising. Like how much of our time was spent correcting first name, last name swaps and date of births that were yeah. slightly off and all of this sort of stuff. Like it's, it's ridiculous. If you're not in the healthcare industry, yeah. you would think that this was a solved problem. But yeah, it's... And then the third not. issue is there's no way to track your claims really. So a lot of administration time is spent on, hey, where's this thing at? Which is call center. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's probably intent, it's, it's the same as, you know, how easy it is to sign up for certain newspaper subscriptions and then, oh yeah, if you want to cancel, uh, please 
send us your phone number as a registered yep. parcel to this address and we'll call you a, between two and three new york times is the infamous one as the joke is that you, you just you just have to be with them for life you remember for life once you're with them yeah i, I mean you know it it really goes to show how things like apple uh and their sort of subscription model so if you subscribe to the new york times within the apple app yeah. you can cancel anytime you want uh and like it'll run through to the end of your payment cycle but like just almost instantly they've gone from a it's really hard to cancel so there's all yeah. this revenue being made because people can't be bothered or can't work out how to yeah. anyone can cancel anytime they want which i I'm, imagine uh, hurt their bottom line i've got a, a debt collector bit. in france chasing me for two euros um, because I signed up for this two euros per month thing when I was there for two months. And the way you had to cancel was you had to write a letter in French cancelling it. It needed to come from a French address and I couldn't do it. And so I just cancelled the credit card to stop this two euros. And now I like once a week get an email from this debt collection try chasing me for two, the auto email for two euros. So if you're out there listening, uh, debt collector, I'm not going to pay it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is a good example of where, you know, at a regulatory level, standard procedures and transparency and things yeah. from who are the bigger players here, which is the insurers, not the tiny little clinics, uh, could make yeah, exactly. big exactly. changes to how this happens. And then the kind of like next area that they said that causes issues in this is that members just don't know what they can claim, so they just throw it in. Most claims are done by physicians, but like, if you're a savvy... If you're a savvy uh, consumer, you're just going to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to try and claim this thing. Yeah, I, I recently, I mean, on the flip side, I recently went to the optometrist and I just wanted my script renewed so I could get some new glasses. I was like, just give me the eye test. I don't really want anything else. And the person there said, look, we know that this stuff right now is zero gap on your insurance. You probably don't need it, but let's just do it anyway uh, because you don't have to pay anything. And they just threw in a bunch of like nonsense, yeah. like photos of my eye and all this crap uh, because it's more money in their pocket. And I'm yeah. sure that similar things I remember things there was that grift there. that you could do where like you could get a fancy pair of sunglasses prescription even if you didn't need prescription through private insurers because it was just like oh we'll reimburse you two hundred dollars a year for prescription glasses and you just had to buy like prescription glasses yeah. and they just like punched the frames out and like yeah that that does seem dodgy but yeah i, I believe it man like I've, I've been to the dentist too where they're like look we need to do i had like a root canal done and they're like which provider are you with because if you're with this provider, we're yeah. going to bill it as items A, B, C, D, E. And if you're with this provider, we'll do yeah. A, B, F, G, and Q. Because like it's the same shit. It's yeah. just slightly different codes with slightly different so, rebates. Claims processing. $165 billion spent each year. Uh, all because doctors are filling out forms. Um, so the next big area is this thing called prior authorization, which is basically this idea that some mm. some procedures are so expensive and extensive that they want to approve it for the patient for before um, the doctor goes ahead and does it. So there's not this awkward situation where the patient suddenly has to pay, which on the surface sounds lovely, but generally what it results in is delay of treatment. Uh, it's not huge, about 20, less than 25% yeah. of, um, of claims are prior authorized authorization um or benefits sorry uh, prior authorization so it's not everything but the ones that are huge administration burden and the reason is is it's basically all uh hard copies less than 21 percent of uh less than 21 percent are done electronically and it's hard copies and it generally requires individual letters and and context explanation by doctors and it's like sending through hard copies of scans yeah. and tests and blah, 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 blah. So hugely burdensome. And 
when does the doctor do their admin? Probably at the end of the week. So people are delayed until the doctor gets to it. So it just sounds like a really, really gross thing to me, this prior authorization. Yeah, and there's probably no incentive for the insurers to push for change in that because I think, again, they're going for the, like, look, the harder this is, the less of these we're going to have to deal with, and they yeah. probably are the big payouts. So, you know, uh, only doing it when it's worth the admin, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's very cooked, though. Yeah. It should not be the way that it's And done. so the rest of the, the rest, that's kind of like the two major areas, and between those two, it's like $200 billion of savings. It's like if you could tackle those kind of areas right um and there's other things in there where it's like oh you should look mm -hmm. at uh there's like a lot of like employee utilization stuff around nurses and like r making sure that the worst performers are up at the top quartile performers and things like that but i don't know that's a bit more like to me there's just these huge low hanging fruit well these very very low hanging of fruit in uh, prior authorization claims processing that just like if they were tackled would would de deliver a lot of the benefit and the yeah. other thing to me as well is not only would they deliver benefit from an administration yeah. uh, cost as well it just sounds like it's going to improve outcomes through speed up treatment and also also just like reducing burnout both for clinicians and it and and patients like one of the big reasons people don't go to the doctor is going to the doctor is really painful and annoying. And part of this is dealing with like getting your money back or getting it paid for. And if you can reduce this, I think it would like help to tackle that a little bit of people are more likely to go to the doctor than, uh, than less likely. So us healthcare, if you're listening, jump into these ones first, don't worry about yeah. the HR department as much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's cash on the table or startups if you're listening. Yeah. Put this at the So side of in terms table. of limitations, <laughs> criticisms, like with all of these big like industry-wide reports, uh, as soon as you jump into the detail, it starts to like get a little bit, oh, this is more complicated than you let on, right? But that's what it is in all of these things. All of these things are meant to be mm. directional estimation. Here's how we're thinking about the problem. Um, and it's not an exact answer, so I'm not sure whether it's 950 billion or 750 billion of an administration spend each year, but it's a big number. We're not sure whether it's 265 or 26 billion in savings, but it's probably a big number. And there's definitely some areas that can be dug into, um, and I'm sure. And the complexity is not captured in a 76-page report on the entire U.S. healthcare system. Well, yeah, and I mean, let's let's also be honest that. This is yeah. a marketing exercise. How many times have you seen that executives spend 14% of their time doing email McKinsey? Like yeah. they, people want this to be quoted in a lot of places because then when, you know, so, or, you know, big hospital Mayo Clinic yeah, exactly. needs some work exactly. done, it's, what are they yeah. going to think of? Um, but I think my biggest criticism is around like the biggest bucket of saving was just like very wishy-washy in terms of what was actually going to get done um maybe maybe that's where you gotta you gotta pay to get the real yeah. insights but um that's that, that was one of my criticisms and then the other is that the, like it just didn't jump into the hmm. reason why the u.s healthcare system is 25 percent of administration which seems to be a lot higher than other countries um so those are those are my criticisms but like what is what does this all mean like cool there's lots of money on the table so what like to me kind of like the summary of this is that high administration costs are not a bad thing but high administration costs is generally a uh, like a symptom of the complexity and regulatory burden of the system um and if you wanted to reduce administration costs you either have to reduce complexity or reduce regulatory burden and i don't think we are in the world where we want to re reduce regulatory burden in the in in healthcare in fact, we're probably going the other direction. There's spaces that there'd be some, uh, some. There's places where you could do that, but on a whole, reducing regulatory burden is probably not on the table. So it's all around. If you wanted to reduce it, it's all around reducing complexity of this to me. And you go. Yeah, I mean, this is. Uh, 
right? This is like regulatory capture 101, right? It's like regulations exist for a good reason. People get ahead of the regulations and work very hard to make sure that they're the only ones that can comply, and then this happens. But yeah, and the moral standing is, well, we can't not do this because, you know, we got to say we got to protect the people. But yeah, I agree. It's very hard. So if to we consider complexity as the years of that, like opportunity to go after here, it seems to me that a lot of the complexity comes from fee for service, which is I did something and I need yeah. to get reimbursed for it. 165 billion a year is just spent on that alone of settling payments and we've talked about value-based healthcare we've never done a huge deep dive on it and what it really means and what it looks like in practice but this is just another indication to me that i didn't really think about as to why value-based healthcare is a better way to think about healthcare spending as soon as you do this you remove you wipe out this financial transaction spend which is 250 billion dollars a year it's gone it's gone it's not exactly zero but like suddenly you're now getting reimbursed at the patient level no matter what you do or the or the disease indication level no matter what you do and it's on you to manage that Yeah, and I think it also shifts the burden back to the insurers or the people paying the bill because, yeah, in the value-based yeah. system, you need to somehow quantify outcomes in order to determine how much you're going to pay out per patient. And, you know, the hospital can do that for sure, but the hospital's default position now suddenly becomes, look, we've got diabetes patients, you're going to pay us the diabetes patient rate. If you want to negotiate the diabetes patient rate, like do your assessment tell us your criteria but that's on you yeah. otherwise i'm just going to keep billing this fixed amount so if that's kind of like my takeaway is that yeah. my biggest learning from this and you know like the actual takeaway from this is that there's a lot on the table for the us there's a lot of simple things that they could probably do to improve the efficiency on certain things um and then like not only will this reduce administration spend but it'll improve the outcomes for patients like, da, 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 da. like that's the actual takeaway from the report but like the thing that stood out to me is that like fee for service mm. this is another nail in the coffin for fee for service for me yeah 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 definitely um yeah but yeah i mean i think the hardest part again is that like you've got a quarter of a trillion dollars of somebody's wages yeah ready to fight this ever changing yeah yeah that's interesting yeah. it's a it's a wild space healthcare it's uh yeah i think and again i don't think yeah. a lot of people realize this from the outside you know it's, it's i think a lot of people think yep i go in i get my procedures i swipe my insurance details and then everything gets sorted out but uh yeah behind the scenes it's crazy and you and it's don't all find faxes out and paper and how nonsense. bad it can be until you're like knee deep in waiting through waiting through neck deep waiting through it yeah well mate did we solve it we we solved we solved data oh, and as always source. Healthcare solved. And right to use, Fair use. And we solved healthcare. Done. I reckon we'll call it a day. All before 10 a.m. Brilliant. I mean, yeah, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Good, good. Oh, well, man, you got anything you want to plug before we say ta-ta? Ta -ta? Just plug the podcast. <laughs> yeah, good, good. I'd... Yeah. Thank you for listening do the youtube stuff subscribe if you're enjoying this content leave us a like leave us a comment if there's anything you want us to discuss uh other than that friends thank you for sticking around for another episode mm -hmm. and we will be back later this week i guess editing might dictate when you see these but uh for another episode until then have a good time don't get sick because it sounds like a nightmare and if you're writing code check with your boss before using Bye, copilot everyone. Ta-ta.